Welcome to the One Cornerstone Online Sermon Podcast, your place to catch up on the most recent messages from Cornerstone. For more great content, check out our videos on our YouTube page and on Facebook at youtube.com slash one cornerstone online and facebook.com slash one cornerstone. But for now, enjoy the message. Well, welcome everybody. Wow. Has this been a crazy week? In just a matter of a few short days, how things can change. It's amazing what can happen in a week's time. In fact, February, just a few weeks ago, was the highest all-time stock market numbers in our nation's history. And then March, bottom drops out of that. Last month, baseball spring training. They're going, getting ready for the season. Opening day is coming up now. We have no sports at all happening. In fact, um, ESPN last week, or this week, I guess, broadcasted a stone skipping competition. That's where we are right now. We are broadcasting an event called the stone skipping competition. The Olympics are postponed for the first time since like Moses was in the Olympics. It's a crazy time that we are in, (laughs) whether you are joining us today as a single person or with your family, I'm really glad you're joining us today and jumping in with us for a few minutes here. In so many ways, my life and your life, they have been turned upside down with this shelter in place orders and all of the other things that are happening in our world right now. And many of you, for many of you, work has stopped or you're trying to work from home, which It's sort of a thing. I mean, it doesn't come without some challenges. In fact, I saw a few memes this week that you might enjoy. I saw a week about working from home. This is the one I really liked. One does not simply work from home without distraction. That is sort of an understatement. There is a basketball goal mounted to the door of the office that I am working from. So that's awesome. Some of you have become instant homeschooling parents. You didn't know you were going to be homeschooling parents. Maybe your children are perfect little angels and that's not really a thing, or maybe you're like the rest of us and you feel kind of like this lady who tweeted out this week. I've been homeschooling a six-year-old and an eight-year-old for one hour and 11 minutes. Teachers deserve to make a billion dollars a year or a week. So true. Teachers are going to get a raise after all this is over and we're not going to complain as much. I think that's one of the things we're going to learn from coronavirus. With everybody at home most of the time, it forces some new disciplines in your life and mine with, of course, those that you love the most. And maybe you can understand this guy. This is my last one, all right? Sheltering in place gives love thy neighbor a whole new meaning, doesn't it? It really does. And maybe that one's a little more real than we would like to admit. I don't know. But we can have a little fun with all that stuff and we can kind of laugh a little bit and try to enjoy it. But of course, in no way do I mean to minimize the situation we're in. It's very serious and it may get more serious as we go. We don't really know for sure. But what we do know is this, and let me just give you some encouragement today as we jump in, all right? What we do know is that there are answers. There are. There are not answers yet on the specifics of the coronavirus, But there are answers on what we do in life, whether or not we're in crisis or not. There are answers about what life should look like. God has given us such clear instruction about our purpose and what we should do to have the very best life this side of heaven, living in what Jesus calls an abundant life or the fullest life we can live. That has already been given to us by God. He's already told us what that looks like. And if you're joining us for the very first time, Welcome. Our mission as a church at Cornerstone is about helping connect people to Jesus. And we're so glad that you're here. And we want to do everything we can to help you down that road. The series we're in right now, we're in a message series called Messengers. And it describes what it looks like to be carriers. Not carriers of some of the illness or harmful things that are out there in the world right now, but carriers of the greatest news ever told, which is the truth about Jesus. We have said that messengers, that everyone who follows Jesus is a messenger, and those who embrace the truth of Jesus and carry it are called to live a dedicated life of faithfulness, a genuine faith, not, not just a series of beliefs or phrases that they can rattle off, but genuinely living it out, that their life is actually changed as a result of the faithfulness that they're living in Christ. In fact, we said the Christian life is best lived, the Christian life best lived is a life that's worth duplicating, 
that when other people see your life, whether or not they know anything about Jesus or whether or not they've embraced anything about faith, that they look at your life and they want to model their life after yours because of the way you've lived. And we ask the question, are you living that kind of a way? Are you living in a way that is worth repeating? Are you fanning into flame as we looked at in the text last week or a week or two ago? Have, have you set ablaze your faith? We've said that messengers have a clear focus. They keep their eyes set on the end game. And they focus most on the things that are eternal, not the ones that are temporary. And today we're going to take that a step further and talk a little bit about purpose. What is the purpose or the job description of a messenger? We've been looking at the New Testament book of 2 Timothy. I hope you have a Bible and you'll join me in 2 Timothy Written by the Apostle Paul, it's a guy who was quarantined in his own way. He was in house arrest when he wrote 2 Timothy, and he stays convicted despite his circumstances. He stays convicted about his purpose, even though his plans are completely thrown off course in his life. In fact, let's pick up where we left off last week. And if you weren't with us last week, you can go back on our website, all of our online platforms, and watch last weekend's message. We're going to pick up in 2 Timothy chapter 2 beginning in verse 15. And we've said this is basically a theme verse for this series. This is kind of the hub of what we want to get at. Chapter two, verse 15. Work hard so that you can present yourself to God and receive his approval. Be a good worker, one who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly explains the word of truth. Avoid worthless, foolish talk that only leads to more godless behavior. Last week we talked about focusing on the eternal versus the temporal. The eternal versus the temporal. So we've got the things that are eternal, the things that last forever, the things that are going to matter forever, the souls of people, God's truth. Those are the things that for a messenger are the primary focus. Those are the big rocks. Those are the the things we want to make sure are, are the highest focal points of our lives and not the things that are temporal or temporary, the things that are going to pass. Although we have to deal with things in the temporal, those are not the things that are most important to our focus and our efforts. And they should never trump the things that are eternal, the things that matter most to us. And the reality is today we live in a world overwhelmed and consumed by COVID-19. And it totally stinks. At the very least, it is completely, uh, completely sets everything off course. At the worst, people are really, really sick and losing their lives over it. And it is temporal. It is going to pass. Friends, it is going to pass. We will get through this right? We're going to be on the other side. We don't know when, we don't know how, we, and we may have to homeschool or work in our stretchy pants longer than we really want to. We may even face genuine health issues or death of loved ones and friends. It may be very, 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 very difficult, very rough for us. It is stuff that we have to get through and deal with, but we are going to get through it. And let's not miss focusing on the things of the eternal, as we sort out the things that we live in the temporal. But there's another layer here, right? We all have work to do. Paul says, work hard, work hard. There's a lot of talk right now about who's essential and who is not essential at work. I don't know if maybe this week you were, or last week you were declared an essential worker or perhaps a non-essential worker. I don't know that anyone was declared a non-essential worker, but if you were sent home or lost your job, that's kind of what the suggestion is. Some of you were labeled essential workers, and you may even not want to be an essential worker. You would just assume be non-essential right now because you don't want to be in the middle of all this. But when it comes to being a messenger of Jesus, every single worker is an essential worker, everyone. Absolutely nothing temporal No matter how significant it is, no matter how challenging it is, no matter how consuming it can be, should stop us or even slow down the messenger of God from doing eternal work, from doing essential work that means we are carrying the message of Christ into every person's life that we have the chance to share it with. Never should it slow down. A messenger, every messenger is an essential worker in the eyes of God. Now, you may rightly be saying, I don't really know what all that means. How how do I do that? What is the job description for essential work? Like, what am I supposed to be doing exactly, especially in the context that we live in right now? Well, let's not make it too complicated, right? We could make it complicated, but that's not ever helpful. Here's what it comes down to. 
Every single person is a messenger in one sense because every one of us, we communicate something. We communicate something. All day long, every day, you're communicating something, whether you're using words, actual words, whether you're posting something online, whether you're sending an email, texting, uh, speaking to people, the way you act, the body language that you, com that you communicate with to your family or friends or roommates or whatever way you are interacting with other humans in any way, you are communicating something. So here is the essential work of being a messenger. If you're writing this down, here it is. Use our words, what we actually say, to connect people to Jesus. Use our words to connect people to Jesus. That is the job description of the messenger, essentially and eternally making sure that those things are happening. In the midst of the temporal, when we're living in the midst of things here, we're not letting those things consume. We get a chance to use our words to live out the eternal or not. And it's about what you say and how you say it. All right, now what you say is all wrapped up in the, the communication that you send out how you are sharing who you are, how you feel, what you think, what you do, all right? So let's, let's talk about, first of all, one big idea about this and how we can live out that job description is this, right? This is the takeaway. Intentionally speak words that give life. Intentionally speak words that give life. In everything that you communicate, in every word you speak, text you send, eyebrow roll, eye roll that you give, try to communicate life. The Apostle Paul reminds us of something that you probably already know, but it really does set the course in how we're living, right? Your words, what you're communicating, it is either life-giving or it is life-sucking. It is either giving life or sucking the life out of somebody every time you communicate, every word you speak, the things that you say, they are either gonna be words that somebody holds on to for life or words that at best are foolishness and at worst actually cause deep hurt and pain. And I'm not trying to be overly dramatic about every word. When you say, please pass the green beans, that probably doesn't count. But you can say those things in a way that starts to cause pain, that starts to hurt, that starts to knock down. In fact, we get an example in the text that we looked at. The very next verses give us an example. Look at verses 17 and following. Paul says this. The, this kind of talk, this, sorry, we just finished saying, <clears throat> we got this foolish talk, avoid foolish talk, worthless chatter that leads to more godless action. Now in verse 17, he says, this kind of talk spreads like cancer. As in the case of Hymenaeus or Philetus. Anybody know Hymenaeus or Philetus? No? Okay, he goes on to say, they have left the path of truth claiming that the resurrection of the dead has already occurred. And this way they have turned some people away from the faith. Everybody say cancer. Everybody say COVID. Everybody say virus, right? Those things get spread. Those things go from one person to another. And as we are trying to do social distancing and figure out how to level the curve and all that kind of stuff with, with the virus right now, the same thing is true. Perhaps, may I suggest even more serious for the long haul about the words that we speak. Second Timothy, this book, was written around the year 65 A.D., that is about 2,000, just short of 2,000 years ago, right? 2,000 years. And yet, every single time in the last 2,000 years, the names Hymenaeus and Philetus have ever been mentioned ever in any context was for one reason and one reason alone. The cancerous, viral words that they spoke that caused deep pain. Their foolishness, their words left a deep wound. Now, we don't even know what they said or who they said it to. We don't even have the, the details of the conversation or how many times did they say something, how long did it go on. We don't know if they even meant what they said or if they said something in a moment of anger or if they you know, came back and made, made it right. We don't know anything about what happened in the context. Here's what we know. Their words sparked a cancerous domino effect of other hurtful words all the way to the point that some unnamed people 
walked away from their faith as a result. They walked away from God. They turned their back on the church. They left the faith because of harmful words. Here's what we also don't know, right? We also don't know, did they feel bad about it? I mean, did they go back and regret what they said and, and make things right? We don't know. What we do know, what we do know is that somebody else was affected. Their words led to regret and hurt in the life of somebody else to a deep, deep way. Whether or not they ever realized it, whether or not they ever felt bad and made it right, they spoke words of regret and it affected somebody else's faith. It should have never happened. And Paul's challenge through that one example is a great challenge for every single person, no matter who you are or where you are in faith, right? But for messengers, if you've claimed Jesus as Lord, and this is at the core of your purpose. Messengers earn the right to talk about Jesus with people when they speak Jesus-like words the rest of the time. Like all the time when we're just dealing with copiers and you know deliveries and emails and business meetings and kids and, and parents and we're dealing with that kind of stuff. If your words are life, then you earn the right to share the truth of Christ. But if your words are covered in sarcasm, your words are constantly full of anger and filth, friend, you negate the right to share the greatest news that you could ever share with somebody. You negate the right. Words are powerful. They can bring life and fill people up or they can tear down and turn away the hearts of the people that God has put in our lives. So we gotta speak words of life and we've gotta intentionally Make sure that the words that we speak and the way that we speak is in a way that is going to honor and uplift, pour life into somebody else. Words of life. And the truth is that God, in his great love for each and every one of us, friends, that don't miss this, all right? The gospel is that God sent his only son, Jesus, to earth as a man to experience all that we experience and ultimately to be arrested and killed by a brutal crucifixion on a Roman cross. Despite never ever having sinned or doing anything wrong, he was punished for our sins and he took on the payment of our sin and he died for me and he died for you. And now today we can receive his gift of life by accepting Jesus as Lord, turning from our sin, and walking in freedom with him each and every day. That is a simple gospel. But here's the problem. If you're a messenger of the greatest news ever told and you even share that truth with those that God has put in your path, but your words, the other words that you speak other times are not life-giving, then the message falls on deaf ears. Speak words of life. In fact, let's take a look at the passage as we continue forward. We're gonna jump down to verse 23 of 2 Timothy chapter 2, 223. Again, I say, don't get involved in foolish, ignorant arguments that only start fights. A servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but must be kind to everyone, be able to teach, and be patient with difficult people. Gently instruct those who oppose the truth. Perhaps God will change those people's hearts and they will learn the truth. Then they will come to their senses and escape from the devil's trap. For they have been held captive by him to do whatever he wants. Second big idea is this. Speak truth to lift people up. Speak truth to lift people up. We're going to intentionally make sure that we are pouring life, words of life in. But we need to speak truth to lift people up. There's an elevator principle. Very similar concept, right? Elevators only go two directions, up and down. You're either using your words to lift people up or you are using your words to bring people down and, and just don't play games with yourself, okay? Be honest with yourself about the way you speak, right? The way you speak is probably, if not more important, as important as the actual words that you speak. Notice how Paul is both addressing what we say and probably even more so how we say what we say. Make sure that we're saying things in a way that lifts up and does not tear down. Obviously, it needs to be the truth, right? That, that's the what. What are we speaking is truth. But pay attention to how much he emphasizes the how. Look at what he says. You kind of go back through the text. He says, be kind. He says, be able to, be, uh, be able to teach. 
Be patient with difficult people. Gently instruct. We're talking about how you, he's talking about how we're able to speak those kind of things. And if you let, if you like to quote scripture to people and you like to tell people about your great church that you go to and you, you know, you're constantly sharing things that they're, they're important and good things, but your actions and the way you say things are impatient. They lack kindness. They lack gentleness. You know, the reality friends is that your words aren't going to matter much because you've already communicated what you need to communicate. Literally never has anyone been argued to Jesus. Never has anyone been put in their place to repentance. Never is anyone shamed to the foot of the cross. So many people are convicted that they are right about something. They have the truth, they know the truth, but they beat people up and tear people down with the truth. They are in the most literal sense, Bible bashers, speaking the truth in a way that tears people down. And friends, as messengers, we are called to lift people up with truth. Literally picture them like they have been beaten up and left for dead on the side of the road. And we get the, the chance to just build them up with the truth. Build them up. I like that phrase so much. And explaining what it means to speak the truth in love. Speak the truth in love. It means we love people with the truth. But we're going to think first. And this maybe would help you a little bit. Just, you can write this down. I mean, it goes as far as acrostics go, okay? Think before you share truth. First of all, is it true? Before you share truth, make sure that it is true. Secondly, the H is for, is it helpful? Some things that are true, this is not the time. They're not helpful, right? Next, is it inspiring? Is it actually going to motivate that person or help that person forward? Is it necessary? I think this one's really important. There's so many things that are true. There's so many things that we could say and speak the truth that are just not necessary. And as a result, not very loving, not sharing truth in that way. And the last one is, is it kind? Is it kind? Is the truth that you want to share? And most importantly, the way you want to share it. Is it kind? If you just gave yourself that acrostic, true, helpful, inspiring, necessary, kind, it helps us kind of filter when we're wanting to speak truth or when we feel like maybe God's put us in a position to speak truth to consider how we're going to do it. It's a great filter to help every messenger of Jesus sort out their words and what they're saying to ensure that they are taking the truth that we know, friends, and lifting people up loving them with the truth and not pounding them down with it. When messengers are living on purpose, they are alert and they are ready to speak truth and they are sharing words of truth and even at times saying difficult things. I'm not saying it's not difficult and there aren't things that need to be said, that truth needs to be spoken into challenging situations. It absolutely does. It is done in love and it is done with great care and it is done in kindness, but it is done. We lean in and make sure that truth is spoken into the relationships God has given us. In fact, author J.D. Greer, he says it like this. He says, he calls this, this concept sewing the threads of the gospel into the very fabric of our everyday lives and conversations. When we're doing this, when we're speaking truth, when we're finding ways to intentionally share those kind of words and we're looking to impose truth into people's lives, we are doing so looking at your life and thinking of each and every day and every conversation and every opportunity you have as kind of a fabric, that you are putting together a fabric of all of your words and all of your communication. It's a combination of all of those things. And a messenger is very intentionally speaking life and expressing truth into conversations and relationships all the time, weaving into the conversation. And this is true all the time, but man, right now, Right now, I mean, it's so very true and so very practical in the world we live in when so many of us are living most of our day online. I mean, you think about what you see on TV or the typical conversation with your peers right now or, or even maybe more relevant is what you see on social media. There is so many words. There's so many words out there. 
And there are days in normal life when some people are always on Facebook. Some people just kind of live there. And if you're one of those people at home, just kind of raise your hand. No one will even see you right now, right? But right now, in this world, everybody that's on Facebook is on it all the time. Everybody that's on their computer is on it all the time. We're spending a lot more time online. And if every messenger, every person who is dedicated to bring truth and life through their words would make it their point to just absolutely refuse to get into useless arguments, but instead found ways to infuse life and truth into every conversation and every relationship, how different would that be? Now, if you wanna be weird about it, that's not gonna work, right? You're on a Zoom call with all your you know, business people or whatever, and you know, somebody starts to call and says, you know, isn't the internet great? I'm just so glad we can all connect wherever we are through our computers in our homes. And then you pipe in and go, you know, it reminds me of the Holy Spirit that connects all believers. That might be a little forced, okay? Maybe a little bit. Maybe not start there. But I'm saying share opportunities as they allow. Share how God is blessing you. Share how you have peace in him through this time. Share how you give God credit for what he's doing in your life. Point all the glory to Jesus. Let people know about how God is changing and shaping your life. Weave into the fabric of conversation the truth and life of Jesus. Share a scripture. Reference a sermon that you heard. Talk about the convictions that you have and why you live the way you do. Don't judge but weave the gospel into the words and actions to live on purpose each day as the messengers of Christ. I want to close with this verse. Uh, we, we're going to wrap up here in verse 10 of chapter 3. So we're going to jump down a few verses in 2 Timothy to chapter 10. Here's what Paul says. You, Timothy, you certainly know what I teach and how I live and what my purpose in life is. See how he connects those? what he says as he teaches, how he lives his life, all wrapped up in the purpose of communicating the truth. You know my faith, my patience, my love, and my endurance. You know, Timothy, you've seen it. I have been modeling for you, says Paul, how to weave into the very fabric of life, sowing the seeds of the gospel and life and truth into every conversation. Paul was convicted to live a life centered around that purpose, making sure that his words and his actions were bringing life and lifting up. Because that is the kind of conviction messengers hold on to. Now, if you're with us and you're not a believer, you're not a Christian yet, or you're not sure where you are in faith, first of all, we wanna walk through that with you. We have folks that would love to talk with you. We have folks that would love to have a conversation, a message with you, and whatever way we can communicate right now, we'd love to do that. Paul's words have laid out for us, even in just the verses we've looked at today, a great picture of a life that is lived on purpose for something that is way bigger than ourselves, way greater than ourselves. And it is an invitation to live a life full of purpose and meaning with Jesus as the focus not ourselves. And it is the most compelling and the most fulfilling life that we could ever live. So this weekend, uh, a number of people across the world actually have taken some time to set aside this weekend as uh, specifically today on Sunday as a global day of prayer. And man, people across the world are gonna be praying. And I wanna just take a minute, if you wanna join me, uh, you can get in whatever position is comfortable for you for us to spend a few minutes in prayer. We're gonna put some of these things on the screen for you to be able to pray about, whether you wanna pray quietly as I pray out loud or whether you wanna just uh, pray together as a family. Whatever works for you is totally great, but I'm gonna pray through some things today as we take a moment and join probably hundreds of thousands of other people across the world in prayer for the situation we find ourselves in together. So let's bow for a moment in prayer and uh, let's, let's pray together as a church. Lord God, we pray today that you would cover us. We are coming before you humbly, recognizing God that there are so many people in this world right now, people in our country, even people in our communities who have contracted or are coming to the other side of COVID-19 and we pray for their recovery and their health. We pray, God, for the families of the people 
who have struggled through this, who are living in fear or anxiety right now about this crisis because they are concerned for their own health, they're concerned for a family member, they're not sure about where things are gonna go. God, we pray your covering and your hand on their lives today. We pray, God, today that you would cover every community that is hit hard today by illness and despair by those that are struggling, especially today, Lord, we think of the people in Italy and China and other countries like France, uh, other places in the world, uh, our friends and loved ones in India, who in so many ways, they're on complete lockdown, they're struggling today, hit hard by this, God, would you cover them? We pray today, God, for the people who have lost their jobs or who have been significantly reduced in their revenue and their income as a result of this. God, I pray your blessings on those families. God, would you give them peace? Would you provide ways for them to uh, find ways to pay their bills and to make ends meet in this time? God, I pray specifically today for churches, churches all across this world. Everybody's trying to figure out new ways to do what they do, to find ways to serve and love people when we can't really spend time around each other. And God, I pray today for churches that are, are trying to figure out how to serve and connect, that you would give each of every one of us, not just Cornerstone, but every church, great wisdom and opportunity in this season to be messengers. God, I pray for our missionaries as a church. Specifically, I wanna pray today, God, for the Turkey team, our Turkey team through Team Expansion, the Greisers, and God, that you would cover them today. I wanna to pray today, God, for our missionaries in India, for uh, Ajay and Indu Law and Josh and Lashi Howard and their extensive team and how they are continually working to find out ways to minister during this season. God, would you please cover them? Give them wisdom, give them protection. God, I wanna to pray today for President Trump, for his leadership and the wisdom that it must be so challenging to, to seek right now that he needs so desperately in making decisions for our nation. I pray today, God, for our local leaders, that all of them would have wisdom and clarity in all of the things they have to decide and do on a daily basis. And God, uh, just in closing, I wanna pray today for against this virus. I just wanna pray against it in the name of Jesus that you would just eradicate this virus from this world that you would take it away, God, that in your amazing power, in the name of Jesus, that you would wash it clean, that you would help us to get on the other side of this thing and that you would protect people from contracting it further, God, that you would do what only your power can do in the midst of such a challenging time. And we pray, God, all of these things in the power and the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And God bless you. Thank you so much for listening. We'd love to connect with you. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and on YouTube by searching One Cornerstone Online. You can also find more information about us at our website at onecornerstone.org. 